Welcome to Possibility Project. This is a disruptive conversation series where social sector leaders talk about the big questions we need to answer now. This is our eighth episode and I invite you to check out our previous recordings on YouTube. Uh, the link is gonna be shared in the chat. And um, I want to start by sharing an introduction guidelines um, that I'm gonna follow that one of our speakers, Nova Wren, has presented to us and passed along from the Genesis Healing Institute. So you're welcome to access this resource, use it as well, the link is in the chat. My name is Devin Davey, my pronouns are she and her. My intention for entering our time together today is to hold space for meaningful connections, conversation and expansive learning. Uh, I'd like to share a visual description of my person. So I have shoulder length, uh, straight today, dark brown hair, brown eyes, and a round face. I usually am wearing a smile, and I'm wearing a blue shirt with blue and yellow polka dots um, and some, some dangly earrings. Um, note that we will have a transcript available throughout the episode via Otter for greater accessibility for everyone. Uh, and I'm coming to you from land that was kept and held secret by the Ramaytush and Ohlone Native people. Um, I honor these ancestral keepers of our land where I'm now living, and I honor their descendants uh, who continue to breathe sacred life into our earth. So following that intro, I'd like to share a note on territory acknowledgements. Um, they are one small part of disrupting and dismantling colonial structures. So if you wanna learn more about how this lightly touches the surface of power and privilege, you can read more at nativeland.ca slash resources and the link will be shared in the chat. Um, and uh, on to Possibility Project, uh, Heather and I launched Possibility Project in March of this year, in 2020 with the intention of changing the way that we change in this lead change in the social sector. So the, the, this is one way that we are taking action in uncovering and reimagining how our work can be better in convening and collaborating disruptively. Um, we know that with crises and destruction come opportunity. And we believe that this group here today and uh, the 1200 folks who are from the nonprofit foundation design, higher education and consulting space that we've convened since the beginning of our uh, project are the group of leaders that have the resilience to drive and lead change differently, the, the change that we need today. So um, our folks are coming from the Bay Area, Tucson, Seattle, Chicago, um, other metro areas in, in the US, um, really from all over. Um, so welcome to everyone. Um, I am a strategy consultant and I help female founders and impact leaders get unstuck um, by co-designing and implementing processes uh, and solutions around people and strategy challenges. And um, in the chat, I'll share a bit more about my current project so you can get a sense of how I spend my time and energy. Um, and my co-creator, Heather Hiscox, uh, is the CEO and founder of Pause for Change. And she works with nonprofits, philanthropies, and local government, and helps them address and pursue opportunities in less time using fewer resources while achieving greater impact. So you can check out her awesome work and um, current projects as well as her website in the link uh, in the chat. So you can see our goals and our intentions for our conversation today with Possibility Project. Um, really unite a community, stimulate new thinking and explore collaboration. I added a fourth one for this episode in particular, which is examining our role in transformation and healing, starting with ourselves. Agenda. Today, we are gonna talk about all sorts of great things uh, related to design and healing. And I'll share in just a second, a, a little bit more about our fantastic speakers. Um, I wanna share a little bit about the why behind this topic before that. And then we're gonna go into these four primary questions. Um, the first two are uh, what our speakers are going to address. And the second two, we will address in our breakout rooms together in groups of three or four. So we'll come back to these. We'll also share them in the chat. Don't worry. I know it's a lot of words right now to, to look at. Um, 
So after these questions, uh, the first two questions, we will open it up to a Q&A and hear from you all today. And uh, you can keep those questions in the chat and um, we'll have our speakers uh, speak to as many as we can. And then we're gonna move into breakout rooms for about 15 minutes. And this is where we will address these second two questions. After the breakout rooms, we'll come back, do a debrief, ask our three guests to talk about takeaways and um, kind of what's, what's on their minds and what's sticking with them. Um, and then we will share our next episode and wrap up for the 90 minutes. All right, so with that, I'd like to turn to our guests and we are a little bit different in how we introduce our awesome guests. Uh, each are phenomenal humans and we'll post their bios in the chat. They're in the LinkedIn group. You may have seen them in the email reminders we've sent out. Um, but we'd like to share an interesting tidbit about them and have them tell us a quick personal story. So um, I'm gonna start with Alvin. Alvin Sheck Snyder is a biz ops lead, service designer, design educator, and visual artist. And he's also the operations program manager for the Illinois Department of Human Services. And Alvin's gonna share a story about living in mainland China and uh, share a little bit more about where he had his social impact awakening. Thanks, Devin. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, very excited to be here. So, uh, you know, I was telling uh, Devin and, and Heather earlier, so I moved around a lot as a child because of my father's uh, a job in higher education. And so I had to make new friends um, in different towns like four or five times. And I think that, you know, the downside of that was that I always had to sort of navigate this in-group, out-group dynamic. But the plus side is that I grew an appreciation for immersive experiences and meeting new people and, and, and trying to listen as best as I could. So um, like many of you, I had uh, opportunities to travel abroad and live abroad. Uh, and so uh, I spent uh, one year in the UK during ed my education and then uh, two years in uh, mainland China. And uh, the, the second time I went back, I was in Shanghai, China, working for um, a, a healthcare company. And what I was sharing before was that I, uh, it was during a time when uh, Shanghai was experiencing, and really all of mainland China, uh, a, a, tremendous, a tremendous amount of economic growth. And so outside of this office, I was kind of in like this Tony sort of downtown, like skyscraper, if you can imagine. Uh, and across the street, there was a Ferrari dealership. And so, and yet when you walk outside of the office building that I worked in, I would often see people uh, rummaging through trash cans for food or other items of value. And so for me, seeing that sort of economic divide like right there, then and there, and then also coming from Chicago where, um, you know, my partner used to be a teacher on the West side, it, it just kind of broke my, um, I think my, my perceptions about, you know, really how balanced this world was. And that was kind of the final sort of thing that pushed me towards trying to figure out how I could use my skill sets um, in a sort of social impact manner, so. Awesome, awesome. Definitely world traveler. Um, all right, Nova Wren. Um, Nova Wren is the founder and vision keeper for Genesis Healing Institute. And Nova Wren is an envoy and weaver, a disciple of philosophy of reunion, and a community healing practitioner. And um, Nova Wren is going to tell us a bit more about his time being spent in water. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um... Devin, thank you, Heather. Um, shout out Rachel and Alvin. Uh, it's beautiful to be on this uh, Zoom with uh, all of you and, and welcome to everybody. It's, it's lovely to, to connect um, to all my relatives out there, folks that um, can be new friends. And yeah, I think with, with regard to um, in my former life, uh, I used to be a lifeguard and a swim instructor and um, it was beautiful. So I, I spent an enormous amount of my time in the water. 
um, you know, as we all did, right? First nine months of our lives, we were in water. Um, and um, it was really beautiful, particularly given my, my, my role, who, who I focused on, which is teaching uh, infants, teaching babies how to swim. And that was probably one of my favorite uh, roles uh, back in those days, because you really, you're not really teaching the babies how to swim. You're literally just holding babies for several hours a day in water, uh, which is just a beautiful thing. Uh, and then to see them just get more reacquainted to the water is, is really wonderful. And um, Most of the time, it's actually a lot of inst in instructing the parents um, to just not freak out when they're, it's like, it's okay. Like the baby knows what water is. Like we, we, we understand what this is and um, to be able to acclimate in that way. And I've also been swimming a lot um, just as a, as a daily practice. Um, I don't know how I, I'd be able to do what I do otherwise. And, you know, I, I'll go to the pool maybe like around nine or 10 and it's starting to get cold. And I was thinking to myself, I have no idea how I, uh, how I was able to do the, the swim instruction in the mornings because swim practice would start at like 7 a.m. And we had to get there like 536 to like obviously open the pool to take off the tarp. And, and obviously we had to, we had to be the first ones to get in the water. So I'm diving into ice cold water at 6am every single day. I have no idea how I was able to do that. I get out there at like 10am and it's moderately warm and I, I just can't do it now. Um, so shout out to younger me, who apparently had much thicker skin than I do now. Um, but uh, it really was a beautiful gift and I'm, I'm honored that I get a chance to, to continue um, in present day. So thank Thanks you for letting for me share that. Here. Thanks for being here, Never End. I uh, love the flowy, flowiness of water and what that represents for you too. Uh, Rachel Dekus is a macro-focused clinical social worker focusing on trauma-conscious practices and design and is currently currently the Associate Director of Programs at the Siebel Center for Design at the University of Illinois at, at Urbana-Champaign. And she is going to tell us about a time being in indie rock bands. <laughs> Thanks, Devin. And thank you to Alvin and Nova Wren and Heather and everyone else who's here. I see some, uh, some familiar faces from the School of Art and Design and just some, uh, some fellow alums from the, uh, from the School of Social Work. So it's nice to see, uh, to see everyone. Um, so I think something that, uh, you know, I think most people think of me as either um, you know, in different parts of my, my life over the years as a, you know, a social worker, um, a, an advocate for various causes, um, dating back some of them even into to high school uh, to even present day. But I think a, a hat that I have worn over the years that um, some people are often a little like, caught off guard by is that um, is that I'm a musician as well. And I play, my primary instrument is the violin. Um, although I have a viola that is similar, but it's very, very different from playing the violin. And then I self-taught myself a long time ago how to play the cello, which is also very different from the violin, but violin's my main one. And I've been playing since I uh, was 10. So I can say that I've been playing for 35 years, which sounds very, very impressive, right? You know? <laughs> so if you just add it up, you, uh, you're getting my, my current age. But one of the things that uh, that really drew me to music was uh, my parents having just such an immense um, love for it. Uh, definitely being, uh, you know, younger baby boomers and children of the of the '60s and '70s, that, that was that was a rich part of my upbringing. Um, my older brother is a musician as well, and. Uh, once I hit more high school and college years, uh, there were just uh, many um, opportunities to play with uh, either in bands that I you know, was a part of or friends bands. And so I've probably played and recorded and and or toured with, I'd say easily 20 different bands over the years. Um, don't play as often now because work is just, work is busy and we're actually, um, well, we're all in a pandemic, so it's a little harder to be in a touring band right now. Um, but some of my probably uh, most favorite places that I played uh, have definitely been South by Southwest, um, which is a you know, big annual music conference, music film and, uh, and uh, education conference. Now it's grown over the years. 
um, down in Austin, Texas. Um, let's see, there was another one in the independent music scene called uh, CMJ, which stood for College Music Journal. And so it was a really big deal to have if you released a, an album or a, you know a CD uh, and it and it charted as part of CMJ, um, there were often like uh, significant monetary monetary rewards that came with that. And so I uh, played CMJ Music Festival. Um, let's see, I think probably my my most memorable show was playing the New York Underground Film Festival, and I think that was in. I think that was in 90, 1999. Um, and we played at, uh, at you know, an old, very well-known like, you know, uh, establishment in, in New York City called CBGB's that has since been, you know, torn down and destroyed. But to, to, but to say that I, I played at the same place that the, that the Clash played at is just like, I think probably the coolest thing that, probably the coolest thing that I could probably say that I, that I do. <laughs> so cool. Oh my goodness. Rachel, thank you for that. I, Heather and I promised y'all phenomenal humans, right? Amazing. Um, now our speakers are going to each take a few minutes and share their thoughts on our first question. And we're going to start with Alvin. So Alvin, what are the dysfunctions in the social sector that you're seeing related to design and healing? Yeah, um, so I kind of in thinking about this question, I, I, you know, I kind of think broadly um, and I sort of, I tie things to, for me, you know, design, business operations, teaching, art, all those things to me are tied here because for me, they're just vehicles by which I address uh, a larger issue of social and racial inequity. And so that's sort of the higher purpose for me. And that's, these are the channels by which I address that. So you know, the first dysfunction that I, that I think about that I wanna see disappear is, um, and I think we're starting to see this, is the condition of economic and racial inequity being unseen. And I think, you know, over the years, we've talked a lot about this, but it's really become apparent with COVID. So I'm gonna throw out a few stats, you're probably familiar with them. So if you're talking about employment, uh, I read one stat where 50% of adults have, uh, either been laid off or lost their jobs because of coronavirus. If we're talking about um, housing, I just saw a statistic this morning that said that one in six renters in the US is behind on uh, their rent payments. And the CDC, as some of us may remember in September, put out this really weird public announcement whereby they were saying that housing stability is actually key to uh, public health. That was an unprecedented thing to come from the CDC. Like that's not connected, but it is, right? Uh, so, so many folks are on the precipice of falling into poverty, uh, you know, right now, and I think COVID has made that uh, very clear. From a race standpoint, um, when we talk about COVID, Blacks are five times more likely, Latinx folks are four times more likely to be hospitalized uh, for COVID-19 than, uh, than non-Hispanic whites. And Black communities in general have been experiencing higher uh, death rates because of COVID. Uh, and then also, this is not directly related to COVID, but it's an ancillary issue. There are the unjust killings that we continue to talk about, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Armad, Ar Armad Arbery, um, because we've been stuck at home because of the, uh, the, the, the pandemic and you know, we've seen these injustices. So the unseen becoming seen, right? Lifting the rock over and seeing all the creepy crawlies and the gremlins uh, that we need to face. The second dysfunction that I want to see eradicated um, or just go away is uh, racism not being seen as a legitimate public health crisis. Um, the Pew Charitable Trust, uh, you know, say that Black women are up to four times more likely to die of pregnancy-related complications than white women. Just talked about this, but Black men more than two times as likely to be killed by police uh, as white men. Um, there are other stats around life expectancy being much lower, right? And so all of these things, plus some of the things that I've mentioned, have led to more than 50 American municipalities, um, as well as states like Michigan and Ohio and Wisconsin, passing legislation or making declarations just in this past 2020 year that racism is actually a public health crisis, not unlike smoking or poverty. So that is incredibly huge because once you have that declaration, it means that you can start to you know, state institutions and entities can start to bring to bear interventions to address those things. So that's, that's big. Uh, 
And then the third dysfunction that I, 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 I wanna see go away, disappear, however you wanna say it, is uh, the sort of practice of racial equity being performative in institutions. So I've talked about two sort of macro things, right? But, you know, from the micro within an institution, I think this is uh, very important. There is a, a sort of a genius equity leader, his name is Nathaniel Smith out of, uh, and there's so many obviously, but he's out of Atlanta, Georgia, and he runs this organization called the Partnership for Southern Equity. And he put a post on social media a few weeks ago, sort of just talking about racial equity, which we've been talking a lot about and what's performative versus real. And he kind of just like puts it out there for you know the whole entire sector. And I'm gonna kind of read a few things he says and then I'll shut up. Uh, so for corporations, you know, he essentially says that you know you can invest money in um, you know minority communities to expand your workforce or your market share, but that in and of itself isn't a racial equity strategy. It's good, but it's not a full strategy. For uh, government, so that includes me, you know, he says, we really need to do better about finding indicators and then sharing them with the public as it relates to uh, our, our influence uh, from an administrative side on disrupting and replacing systems of injustice. For foundations, he says, just because you're giving money to advance racial equity doesn't actually mean you are. We have to be critical of the systems in place that act as barriers to equity and whether or not you're either breaking those barriers or you're just strengthening them. And then finally for nonprofits, he says, you know, we can advance racial equity, uh, you know, in the communities that we're working in, but if you don't have folks on your staff that are representative of the communities that you're uh, trying to sort of intercede in, um, or you don't have like folks representative on your staff or your board, then are you just perpetuating the issue? And to bring this all back to design for me, I think that last piece also connects to social design in the field. I believe it was in 2018 that AIGA, the, profession, the Association for Professional Design uh, did a design synthesis. And a lot of us are familiar with the statistic that 3% of all designers in the United States are, uh, are black, <clears throat> excuse me. And so if you think about, and that's just, that's just that one sort of population, but if you think about how many design firms in the US are social focused and then you distill down to how many of those social focused design firms have staff of color, have black staff or you know, Asian staff, Latinx staff, staff who are unable bodied um, that are representative of the communities that projects are being run in. I think that there's a, a still a huge gap. And so I wanna see the field of social design be more intentional about ways to build pathways uh, for folks representative to actually do the design work and, and you know, not just the, the support stuff, but really the nitty gritty design stuff. So those are my uh, three dysfunctions that I want to see uh, go bye bye. Amazing, Alvin. Amazing. Thank you. I want to highlight the person that you were speaking about, Nathaniel Smith with Partnership for, so for Southern Equity and highlight what Connie shared a resource on racism and health outcomes related to what Alvin was talking about. And now we're gonna turn to Novaren. Same question to you on dysfunctions and however you wanna take it. Sounds great, you can have folks hear me. All right, lovely. Thank you so much, Alvin, um, for that truth. Uh, appreciate that. Um, and you know, the way I kind of thought about this question um, was just to be able to put out kind of how I see this moment, or at least how I've experienced this moment over the past few months. Um, and I wanted to begin by just kind of uh, offering up what I believe to be the role of healing in this, uh, as we call it, global transformation. Um, uh, but before I get into that, I wanted to just, you know, offer again, gratitude to Devin and Heather for, for setting up the space, gratitude to all of my beloved teachers, um, gratitude to this land, um, Yakut's land that I'm on currently, where I'm currently living, um, and to everyone who's ever supported, loved me, believed in me, otherwise I would not be here. Um, so in terms of healing, I think that uh, one of, uh, one of our dear teachers, uh, Carolyn Miss, really uh, puts it really well. I love the way that she frames it. Um, she says that we've, we've exited the era of problems and we've entered into the era of predicaments. And the way that she explains the difference is that 
when you have a problem, you uh, try to analyze, figure out what's going wrong, where the error is, where the corruption is, and then you create a plan to try to fix it. And then you implement those step by step and ultimately you get a resolution. That's how you correct a problem. We no longer have problems as a species, uh, as a globe. Um, we are in an era of predicaments and the difference between a problem and a predicament is that a predicament requires us to grow. It requires us to change rather than to produce some type of external fix um, or patch or redirect or whatever the case may be. And, the, um, and that process of internal growth, of changing the ways that we live, the ways that we relate uh, to ourselves and to each other is inherently a healing process. And so I think that the, uh, all, at all levels of change, uh, it, the, the process is a healing one uh, to undo, to unlearn um, the conditioning is given to us and to be able to come to life in so many ways. And there are three facets of that experience that have become really pronounced for me um, as I've done this work for, for the past few months and obviously for, for several years prior to that. Um, one is the, the transition from the internal to the external or from the external to the internal. Uh, so much of our existence um, up until this point was really focused on the external. Um, at the most destructive level, you can look at something like colonialism, right, as, as um, a manifestation of that exercise. It is this consumption of everything around us, everything um, outside of us, and a looking to everything outside of us to deliver on the things that we want inside. And uh, I think that the transition that we're in now is an internal one to actually look within ourselves um, to make manifest the changes that we want to see. Um, and I, I, I sense a lot of folks struggling with that. And Alvin was speaking really uh, beautifully about um, racial justice and racial equity. Um, you know, we just came out with a, a kind of healing path to racial equity publication. I know De Devin can put it in the chat if you'd like. Um, but uh, you know, the, the question about wanting um, racial justice, but not uh, being able or willing to relinquish our own allegiance to our racial assignments. And that that is a fundamental key to being able to achieve in this instance, racial justice, but you can extend it to any other, our gender assignments, our socioeconomic assignments, all these like social conceptions and conditionings that we accepted uh, and then we lived our lives um, out of. The, the second um, major aspect to this global transition um, for me is, um, is cultivating a sacred relationship to death. And uh, we have seen very uh, keenly, uh, in very devastating ways, um, death uh, in our society, in our um, communities, uh, in all types of ways. Um, but death isn't always isn't isn't only the you know what we call brain death or the the ceasing of life in in the body, but um, but death carries a, an energetic and a spiritual signature as well. Uh, that when I choose to act differently, when I choose to um, leave my job, when I choose to uh, leave certain relationships, that is also a death. Um, it is a new form of me. It is a new um, aspect of me that I wish to grow. And uh, a really pivotal and fundamental aspect of any type of change, any type of transformation is the death. Uh, I'm not sure if a caterpillar knows when it goes into the chrysalis that it is going to die. Uh, that's exactly what happens, right? Literally, it dissolves into goo uh, before it can become a butterfly. But I imagine that process of turning into goo is not a fun one and is not a painless one. And so, it, but it is a reminder that it is part of the process that if we wish to um, bring forward this beautiful world that all of us imagine and all of us advocate for, that there is a process for us internally to do so as well. And that process is probably not gonna be very fun and probably not gonna be very easy and maybe painful at times. And, um, but the, uh, and, and that path is made harder in a society that really abhors death, that um, pushes death into either a fictional space or, or into something that is going to happen very, very far away from now. Death is all around us. Death holds our hand um, from the moment we come into this world. And so transitioning into um, a sacred relationship to death, knowing that death 
is what gives us life. And knowing that uh, this life, this existence is gonna end for me, provides me an added uh, push to make every second um, one that is really deeply meaningful and fulfilling. Uh, and that leads me to the, the third aspect to um, it's kind of this moment in this global transition, which is a reunion. Uh, that this moment is all about us coming back together, returning to each other after decades, hundreds of years, possibly thousands of years of being so deeply isolated from each other, so deeply separated from each other on so many levels. And because we've become so deeply estranged from one another, that reunion is going to be really difficult. It is coming back into um, community with folks that either we know as strangers or um, at its worst that we've come to know as enemies. Um, and so the, the major aspect of this transition in this moment is to, to learn how to come back to each other uh, with um, compassion and grace and forgiveness. Uh, that none of us are getting off this planet regardless of um, what we did or who we voted for or what um, political leanings we have. Um, we all are gonna need each other in the end. Um, and that reunion is uh, where we're all going to. And it's certainly my hope that that reunion is not of conflict and of war, uh, which we are very well set up for in, our, in all of our camps and all of our uh, uh, different factions, uh, but it's a reunion um, of remembering and that, uh, that coming back together will help us reconnect to ourselves, to our bodies, and ultimately to the planet. I, I feel like, uh, <laughs> you know, you, um, I think sometimes when you, when you do these types of um, talks and conversations with others uh, that you admire, but maybe haven't had a, that opportunity to really interact with just yet, you, um, you think about like, what are, what are my peers going to say? Like, what are they, what are they going to talk about? And I think in some ways, um, I, both Alvin and Nova Ren spoke to some of the 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 very things that are hello, it's Natalie. That keep floating around in my head, um, and I, you know, there there are a few things that I that I wanted to mention um, as far as uh, dysfunctions, and it's 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 well known and it's been well documented and shared. Uh, I think just over the past uh, several months, the you. Know, various um, crises. Alvin talked about, um, you know, some that, that have, that are just a bit more spotlighted now, but have been crises for centuries. Um, Novaren spoke to some of the, uh, just the, the tuning into our own internal transformations and the, the impact that that has and it, that it, uh, that it brings to the work that we do. Um, that's something that I definitely, I, I, I think about uh, almost constantly, uh, especially as it relates to just design and the emerging design work that I'm trying to do. Um, I think two, two of the biggest um, dysfunctions, I wanna sort of try to talk about um, some specifics, but then also some uh, you know, ideals in some ways. Um, I really think that uh, whether you categorize it as mental health or behavioral health, um, well-being. Um, like that is, uh, that is, that is clearly has been an ongoing crisis, um, not just in the United States, but around the world. And if, if anything uh, that I've seen just in amongst my, my peers who are either fellow social workers or are, um, you know, trained therapists, uh, counselors, the, the access to care is, uh, has been problematic for a really long time. And uh, and the pandemic has shown that there are significant cracks in, in all those systems. Clearly, we see that in healthcare. Um, you know, my my partner works in healthcare. I used to work in healthcare, so I, I we're, we're sort of we're tuned into these things. Um, and so I I see access to to care, uh, whatever that might mean and whatever that might look like for um, each individual, is uh, is just crucial and ongoing. We hear that we hear this. Uh, daily at this point, if not hourly or even by minute, um, because we're amidst a, a, you know, a contentious presidential election in the US. Um, so 
access to those services and I think uh, the ability to tap into um, long-term and adequate services is, uh, is crucial. One thing that I've seen uh, just more you know, on a personal and anecdotal level is um, individuals who would maybe characterize themselves as very strong and never needing that kind of service before um, are, are really seeing and, seeing and feeling like susceptible to, uh, to just the, the demands of, of, of what uh, the pandemic especially is bringing to them and to their individual families. So that leads me to the, the next thing is just, um, you know, families, I think also um, working parents and especially uh, just working women in general. Um, I, 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 you know, the past two weeks, there's at least uh, a, a couple of articles that pop up into various feeds. Like I, I try to not see some of these things, but they're just, they're, they're there finding me and they're probably finding me through like a hopefully not a, a, a racist or biased algorithm, but I would uh, uh, be shocked if it wasn't <laughs> a biased algorithm that's like, that's, that's finding me. But I do think that, you know, on a more serious note, I do think that a lot of um, women in particular, but also like, uh, you know, working, uh, you know, women who are parents are really finding uh, some serious difficulties. And, uh, I, I hear this uh, almost daily from a number of my own like friends and colleagues. Um, I'm experiencing that as a as a mom of a of a third grader uh, trying to you know juggle homeschool with you know her dad and and work and you know and and just keep going. Um, and so it leads me th these these two things are really big parts of my own identity. I think as a as a social worker and as a as a designer. And it makes me think about what are the practices that we can actually um, study and embody and uh, fully integrate into the work that we do, whatever that is, or to the, the, the our, our daily approach to some of these um, just systemic challenges that are really presenting themselves uh, in a much more apparent and blatant and sometimes really crude way. Um, so this, this idea of, of practice, um, but also patience with that too, um, and the, the element of patience that, that comes to mind for me, um, it, it, it links in many ways to leadership as well. So leadership within any of our organizations, our partner organizations, whether this is at the um, you know, state and governmental level, like for, uh, for Alvin or the uh, nonprofit or the social sector level as, as for the work that uh, Nova Ren is doing, or, you know, in, in higher ed where you see uh, pockets of great leadership and then um, silos of just the, the, the most ineffectual uh, lack of leadership that is uh, just especially shocking and especially in the time of a pandemic. And, and what kind of an impact does that have on people's daily lives and daily ability to really uh, bring their their full selves and their whole selves to uh, to their work, uh, and to just being, um, you know, beyond resilient. You know, it, it's I, I just I I've really myself I've been um, especially since I've been really focusing on this this combination of what does it mean to be trauma conscious in in a design space. Um, it's some might say it's it's maybe it's easier for me to do because I'm a social worker and I've been doing this for about ten years. I feel like, uh, I don't know what I've been doing the past 10 years. It feels like I'm just now starting to be a social worker actually. Um, and, and social work is being redefined and reimagined in its own way because it has many of its own problems and flaws. And so how do, you, how do, you, how do we embrace these, uh, these best practices and with patience and grace as Nova Ren really like, you know, just beautifully said, and, uh, and, and focus on that internal work so that it uh, is not negatively impacting the, the other work that we are, that we're doing while we're here. Rachel, you took us to such a great space around practices, everything you shared and touched on. Oh, so amazing. I'm gonna try to do a bit of a recap and then we're gonna move into talking more about what's emerging. Um, some of the questions that I want to resurface are, what does it mean to be resilient as a leader and community member, or to be transformative in our work? 
uh, or regenerative in our approach to designing policies, practices, and structures, uh, practices and structures that truly serve those they're intended to help. So I'm hoping we can tackle more of these questions in this conversation. Um, and, and we're talking about some really tough topics. Um, trauma, recovery, healing, identity, crisis. These are really, really tough transformation. So I wanna go back to what Nova Ren shared um, in our prep call and also a little bit earlier. And it really struck me. And he called out that we're in a moment of reunion. I'll say that again. We're in a moment of reunion. And after having been so isolated and detached from each other for much longer than when COVID started, we now have the opportunity to come back together, connect with ourselves and really more deeply than ever. So um, Rachel had also shared previously, you know, and brought up this, this crisis of connection and um, what this moment means in re-examining our identity. And if I can share something vulnerable, Rachel, um, you had talked about how you may or may not see yourself as a healer. And I think collectively and individually, we're moving through this re-examination of our identity and unlearning and learning how to be differently now. And so arguably design and healing is the most important work we can do right now um, to really get to the transformation. And so I think the, the question that's super relevant uh, for me, and, and we've talked a lot about this is, you know, what's emerging? What's giving you hope? Um, where are these restorative spaces for ourselves and um, others being held and created? Um, and where are we doing more help than uh, harm? And, and so just a note too, I, I want to, as our featured guests have already shown up with such deep vulnerability and authenticity, I wanna invite everyone to keep sharing with, the, with that vulnerability and authenticity in mind. Um, as we examine kind of our own trauma and recovery and transformation and these really tough topics, especially as we move into breakout groups after this. So um, I, I wanna turn to, to Alvin uh, right now. We haven't heard from you in a second. And so, um, and then we'll just kind of flow. I think whether, you know, Nova Ren or Rachel wanna pick it up. What's emerging for you? I, I'm still like processing a lot of things that were said that were new that we haven't we hadn't chat, chatted about before and I'm like oh man that's that's so great that's so profound um I so this actually does go back to a conversation we had earlier um, and I think it was Rachel who started this conversation you know I'm not I'm not a social worker I'm not a healthcare worker I've worked in healthcare sort of spaces and social sector spaces that touch on that um, and so when we talk about healing um, and trauma for me I often gravitate towards what is relevant for me and what's relevant for me is thinking about organizational systems um, and ecosystems and, you know, sort of like what is broken, what is trauma inducing in a sort of social ecosystem or within an organization. So if you think about, for instance, the relationship between, um, you know, social sector, social impact organizations, no matter sort of how they're incorporated in the communities that they're in, I think one thing that's emerging for me and that I'm seeing more dialogue around is sort of the intention of being in someone else's space um, when you are trying to um, solve some sort of social problem. So even in the beginning, um, Devin, uh, when you were explaining um, the sort of methodology or background along what we, you were sharing about the land that you are, um, you know, presently on, I'm starting to see that more and more and more. And it's, 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 it's great for me to self-reflect on sort of the space I inhabit. Um, and it's great to see overall, but I think it speaks to a, a bigger sort of conversation again around, um, you know, whatever sorts of interventions or, um, you know, community uh, development sort of projects or processes, design projects we're talking about. If, if there is no sort of, um, you know, trust, or there is, you know, harmed, you know, sort of like a, a traumatic relationship because of um, 
disinvestment in the past or um, you know misaligned expectations versus what you know the community expected versus what sort of um, a community developer sort of presented then that creates trauma and it makes it harder to get back to uh, you know trying to collectively solve a problem so I think about that a lot I also think uh, in terms of you know the, the, the communities within an organization right so I work for the Illinois Department of Human Services. We have um, almost 14,000 staff. We're one of the largest agencies, state agencies in the state of Illinois. It's just a lot of people. Uh, and, and so when you're talking about, you know, in my, my circumstance um, from a business operations or service design uh, standpoint, creating strategies or uh, sort of interventions to solve internal processes, make them more efficient or um, innovate on them, it, it's, it's incredibly important that I'm thinking, that we're thinking about, um, about the end user. It's more than the end user, but it's you know just the folks who are in the organization who've been here 20 years, um, how involved are they, right? Are they invited to actually strategize a design project from the beginning, um, which is something I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do, or do we bring them in at the end where we're like, hey, here's your solution, time to buy into it. Um, not only does that usually not work, especially in government, that doesn't work, but also that's not honoring um, the space that people have already been inhabiting as they've tried to make internal systems work. So I, I, th that creates more trauma within an organization. And so those are the sorts of places that I think I'd like to see healing uh, really, really take place. Thanks, Alvin. Keeping with the thread, Nova Ren, what are you seeing emerging that gives you hope? And, or you brought up a lot about transformation. Where are you spending your time and energy in seeing what works in transformation? Yeah, um, thank you, Deb. Thank you, Alvin. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think for me, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that give me an enormous amount of hope. Uh, I'm really blessed to be able to do this, um, do this work and to walk this journey um, and to be surrounded by uh, such a beautiful community of people at Genesis and you know throughout the, the Genesis network. Um, I think that the, there was a couple of things that came to mind as, um, as Alvin was speaking <clears throat> and then over the course of this conversation. One is I'm, I'm incredibly excited for the the introduction of the the third entity into the binary. Um, so what I mean by that is that um, you know within any binary system, the minute you introduce a third entity, a third energy, a third whatever, it fundamentally changes the entire um, environment, the entire um, system. And I think what we've seen emerging for a very long time and what continues to emerge, it's so powerful is the, the third entities offering us um, the potential to, to be freed of these binaries. So, you know, for example, um, in gender, I think that um, transgender folks or gender expansive folks are offering, offering um, cisgendered people an opportunity to see with, with kind of true vision, the lies and delusions of both uh, genders, right? That these containers, these boxes that in no way could ever contain the deep and infinite complex mystery of the human experience. Um, same with race, right? I think that quote, multi multiracial people and the experience of navigating through different worlds prevent, provide us that same frame of how um, deeply pernicious and limiting um, racial category and racial assignments are and an opportunity to be able to exit from those and to, um, to return to becoming artists of our own life and, and how it is that we identify rather than these impositions of identity that have so imprisoned us for um, certainly all of my life on this planet, uh, maybe much, much longer. Um, the second thing that um, I'm seeing emerge that is really beautiful to me is, is uh, and this I think could be particularly useful for folks in design, is um, a return to, um, to nature and the natural world as a frame for everything that we do. Um, so 
uh, give you like a very concrete example for Genesis. So the way we operate in terms of our programs is we operate on the same cycle that every other creature on this planet, except for one species, I'll let you guess which one, um, operates on, which is the seasons, right? That every creature, every plant has a time to blossom, a uh, time to hibernate, a time to see, to germinate and come back. That is the, the, um, the not so secret secret to how life sustains itself on this planet is that there's time for, and so we have that in the seasons. And so in all of our programming, we incorporate that too. So if we have a program, there's a certain percentage of time where we're preparing for that program. And then we do the thing that the program is meant to do. And then we enter into a phase of reflection around what uh, we learned, what we gained, how we grew. And then we don't touch it for a very long time. We don't email about it. We don't talk about it. We just let it sit. And we allow ourselves to rest and regenerate before we go back in. And we spend about a fourth of our time in each of those phases. Um, and so that's, that's just one example of the many ways that um, we can take advantage of the absolute wisdom that somehow every other creature and plant on this planet has figured out how to sustain for billions of years um, and to be able to regenerate that. And so to be able to incorporate that into all of the ways that we operate, I think would be really powerful. Um, we do that the same with just the amount of hours people work um, and things like that. And then the, the last thing I wanted to share um, that gives me a lot of hope uh, in, in all this is that folks are just, are just coming to life. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. Just leaving their jobs, leaving their relationships, leaving their um, cities, just like, I'm done with this. Like I was given this precious life and this precious soul and I don't know when it's gonna end. And obviously with COVID, you know, that that definitely is a um, an additional danger and all these other things. Like, let me take these gifts, this beautiful gift, whatever your gift is, right? Art, music, you're really good at listening to people. You're, you're a writer, you're whatever the case may be. You're a farmer, gardener, um, caring for children. This is like, whatever your gift is, um, seeing so many people relinquish the life that they surrendered themselves to and give themselves over to the gifts of their souls um, has been so powerful, so amazing. It gives me a tremendous amount of hope. And I think that if every, every being on this planet um, chose that path, um, you know, a path of fulfillment and connection, um, that we'd be able to you know, bring about a, a level of transformation I don't even think we could e even imagine. So yeah, those are, those are some of the things for me. Oh, that just warms my heart, the path of fulfillment. So that's the future that we can create right now. Um, I wanna turn to Rachel quickly and then we're gonna move to questions and um, we're gonna do, we're gonna do abbreviated questions because we've all, we've had a lot of talking time, which is great, this is what we want. Um, but Rachel, before questions, what is giving you hope? Yeah, I think um, I think things that, that both Alvin and Nova Wren um, uh, spoke to definitely are, are some some of the same things that are giving me hope. Um, I I have to say I I think that uh, something that there are two really two distinct things that I think have given me some hope, and one is that um, I. I, th I think up until probably this year, I had a really hard time describing to um, to people who didn't know much about social work what social work was and what social workers do, and um, and so I feel like there's been an opportunity for that to be really um, uh, really highlighted, um, elevated, um, called into question, uh, and and. Uh, lots of uh, conversation that has that has brought many um, a wide variety of different generations of social workers into the fold to really examine uh, the brutal history of social work, in, at least in this country, and where do we want it to go? Um, and so I think that's that's something that gives me some hope. I, I see a lot of people who want to contribute to that change, and I think that's I think that's important to just acknowledge that and to um, and to try to spotlight that a little bit. 
I think another thing is that, you know, you mentioned this word um, recovery, you know, especially from when we were doing the prep call and, or this mentioned the word healing. And it really made me think of, you know, it, I don't think of myself as a healer and, and what, what is my interpretation and understanding of that word. And I think uh, just over the years, professionally, that word has been recovery and uh, that, that language has just been much more um, like prevalent in, in maybe my, you know, day-to-day -day professional work. Um, and it really dawned on me, uh, not so much when I was a social worker, but when I was a social worker working in more of a design space, especially in higher ed, that it, uh, it just made me realize that we're probably all in recovery or, and or healing from something. Um, and it doesn't need to be something uh, necessarily uh, huge and devastating, um, but, it, but it may very well be. And it might be quite layered. It could be uh, generational. Um, and, you know, I, I think about the, uh, just the, the heightened awareness that's come from that. And I think the, the ability and the opportunity for people to be more accepting within themselves, but then also of others for, uh, for working through that. Um, it, it's, it is a lifelong commitment. It is not a, there isn't a, a date that has a destination point. Um, so, you know, I really think of this, you know, I, I really echo some of what uh, Alvin and Nova Ren said that this is, it's, it's lifelong, as long as we are here, uh, transformative work. And um, I mean, I feel like in some ways, what, as Nova Ren was talking, I was about to quit my, quit my day job, you know, <laughs> type that <laughs> you know but it, it, it you know in all seriousness I, I think I think a lot of us who are who are in that position to uh, that we do have that that privilege and that opportunity to to still be working and to still be doing the work that we want to do and that we get to do it really does open up you know is this um, is this what I want to be doing and I think it's I think those are I think we feel guilty about those things uh, more often than not. And I think it's okay to examine those and it's, and it's, it's uh, uh, perfectly normal and, and uh, you know, honestly, like it's respectable to yourself to, to, to honor that reality. Um, so yeah, I think those are, those are things that give me, that give me hope that, uh, that openness, that opportunity to really, um, to, to live your truth. Amazing, amazing. Um, I, I wanna to turn to some questions. I think we have time for about two and Heather, I'm gonna ask you to look at the chat and see what questions folks have who are all on the call for our three guests. And I'm gonna kick us off with the first one. And this is a question that the guests actually came up with in our, our prep chat. I'm gonna give it back to you. And it is how, uh, how do we heal in design with the gap between what's accepted as valuable and what's not? So I'll repeat that. How do we heal in design and design for the gap between what's accepted as valuable and what's not? Alvin? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So much has been said, um, especially by previous, you know, folks that have been on here, like Leslie Ann Noel is on here. What's up, Leslie Ann? Um, around design education, um, who, who, who gets to be called a designer versus who, who doesn't. And, and for me, because I didn't start out in design, that was not my, I didn't go to design school. I kind of fell into it um, because George and Sarah Cantor A were like, hey, we need an operations person. Alvin, can you work with us at Greater Good Studio? And I was like, yeah, sure. I don't know what human-centered design is. Is that cool? And they're like, yeah, it's cool, we'll teach you. And so um, shout out to them for teaching me. But that, I, that's sort of my on-ramp, but I, I come at this again, more from sort of like a social sector, political science, sociology standpoint. And for me, I always go to lived experience. I, I think lived experience is something that I have observed um, in 
the field of design as not not really valued and that's not it's it's not I think it's a larger sort of pedagogy like sector issue and it's it's not just social it's not just design obviously I think there's so many other areas where that's true but I think the reason why it stands out to me um, from a social impact standpoint is because design is kind of like it's kind of like the trendy thing like everyone's trying to figure out like how it sort of applies and it's 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 it's, it's a great sort of time to to be in the field but um you know we know again that not that many uh the majority of designers in the united states are, are white and male part of that has to do with access uh the affordability of uh, a design education uh part of it has to do with uh just the sort of lack of awareness that uh people of color um minorities uh have of uh design as a career so you know uh Creative Reaction Lab with uh, Antoinette Carroll and uh, a number of great other folks. Uh, that's the type of work that they address, um, as well as Leslie Ann and, and many others. So I, I think you know the question. The question is, how do we bridge folks who have lived experience to these opportunities to be able to um, leverage those nuanced perspectives? In, in design, not as tokens, but as like actual real doing the work, doing the design research, doing the communications design, the synthesis, all of that stuff. Um, and 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 so I, I, you know, for me, I think that that's where you start to get at that. I'm going to turn to our three guests and ask each to share about a one minute, take us home, close us out. And I'm going to ask uh, Rachel to go first. Sure. So um, I, there clearly have been these themes of transformation, um, inner work, um, internal processing. How do you pay attention to, uh, how do you use your body? How do you pay attention to your body? How do you, uh, uh, instill and ensure uh, purpose in what you're doing um, while you're here. And I feel like going from uh, the three of us talking to the conversation, to the, the breakout rooms, to then now closing it out. I mean, there really is this, um, this just, you know, someone in our, in our group, uh, her name, name was Kate, uh, was talking about just the, the, um, the dynamics of, of a discipline like design and the, um, the transformative roles that, um, that it has and, and the evolution of that. And so I think uh, I, I, would, I want everyone to, uh, to, to think about what that means for them individually in terms of some of the things that we talked about today. Um, how are you going to show up for, uh, for yourself in whatever work that it is that you're doing? And how will you, how will that impact um, and transform um, others and the work that you do as a result? Thank you, Rachel. I'm going to turn to you, Alvin. Yeah, we talked about in, in, in our group, um, I was with Diane and Christopher um, and learned about uh, their work with sort of designing for designing i'm getting the term wrong but designing for the ecosystem designing for the natural world which is what um i think nova ren has been speaking to and then christopher was talking about um from a social work standpoint how do you design with indigenous populations um and then i saw before we broke out there was a question and it was a really good one or a statement around emphasizing strengths um, and not just talking about the things that are broken. And there was this whole sort of dialogue there. And I, I think, you know, for like all of this, I think goes back to this idea that um, we individually can have trauma. We, there can be relationships that are um, in need of healing. Um, and I 100% I believe that 
you know, having a strength-based focus is incredibly critical. Um, I think what I've observed even in trying to emphasize that is that some communities have gone through so much traumatic experiences with uh, outside communities coming in or within an institution, you know, folks with power and, and the titles coming in and trying to change the way things happen or solve a problem without conferring and understanding sort of context that people are hesitant to even sort of share themselves at times, like to share sort of their full selves and like what they have to bring to the table because they think as soon as I bring it to the table, you're going to take the whole table away from me. And so I think as we, we mine for, or that's probably not, we, we search for the strengths and we recognize we also still need to be vulnerable and acknowledge past harm. Even if it wasn't yours, you may still be in a position that's representative or resonant of the trauma that people have experienced in the past. And you just, we're not gonna get any further unless we acknowledge that with, with communities. Super powerful, Alvin, thank you. Nova Ren, in our last minute, take us home. Last, last word, yeah, of course. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Rachel, Alvin. It's been lovely to, to be on here with y'all. Thank you for your wisdom, your courage, and your light. Um, thank you, Devin and Heather. Um, and thank you to the whole crew. Uh, shout out to group number five, um, Zave, Leanne, and, and Gabrielle, y'all are dope. Um, I'm sure everyone else here is dope too. I just didn't get a chance to meet you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the one thing I, I, I wanted to share has just been shared with me um, by, by my teachers. And, and I think it's really profound um, wisdom and been, been very supportive and true in my experiences. Like in the moments when things get really hard, uh, really, really difficult, whether it's personally, professionally, whatever the case may be, um, to, to be able to sit back and reflect and ask the question, um, am I doing this alone? Uh, and that uh, everything that is, um, uh, whenever there's a difficulty or a challenge, um, it's definitely been, the, been true in my life that as I look around, it's because I haven't asked enough people for help or I haven't brought enough people into the fold. And so to, to reflect upon um, is what it is, is the thing that I'm doing, this transformation, this initiative, this effort, am I bringing in enough people? Do I have enough backup? Do I have enough people in my crew um, to make this happen? And uh, it also is a, a relinquishing of another, I think, colonial mentality, which is the, this, this, um, this uh, almost this near omnipotent um, uh, self-sufficiency that I am capable of moving and shifting and shaping the world as I see fit, um, which is a really destructive delusion. Um, and that I hope I, I can dissuade all of you from, uh, I can't imagine that you all participate in that because you're on this call, but um, yeah, I think to, to bring in as many folks as possible to align to whatever it is that you wanna do and make it a whole lot easier. Amazing. Nova Ren, Alvin, Rachel, thank you so, so much for being with us today and sharing your deep experience and wisdom. Thank you all for joining us and we will see you on our next episode of Possibility Project on November 18th. We're going to be talking about collective action and leadership models. Can't wait to see you there. All right, take care y'all.